I'm here with my buddy Aaron Utecht from North Dakota. We met in the Black Hills of South Dakota to talk about the book of Ephesians, which we've both been working on. If you have not seen our unbelievably long introduction to the book of Ephesians video or po listen to the podcast version, you might want to check that out first because there's some stuff we'll be referencing back to there and because we had fun and it's really good. I mean, it's like a a minus. It's C at least a minus. C plus. Yeah. yeah. It's we tried idea. hard and we had fun. So what we're going to do now is some shorter episodes where we talk about each of the books of Ephesians. This will be Ephesians chapter 1. I don't think we're ever going to actually formally read the entire thing. So if you want to pause and read this chapter first, that might benefit you. But right now we're going to tune you out a little bit and just have a talk about Ephesians 1. Also, to be fair... Uh, I should let you know that I specifically told Aaron, don't prepare for the thing. Let's just discuss it like civilized, normal human beings and see what we get out of it instead of having a, a big fancy presentation on it. So if, uh, if it feels a little bit clumsy, then we're doing it right and you are receiving it as it was meant to be received. So uh, Ephesians chapter one, why is this chapter in here? What does it mean? Uh, we, we alluded to this in the first episode that it lays the groundwork for kind of a cosmic overview it, 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 there's from beginning to end God has a plan for all things the grand scope of the universe and the story of redemption and as you pointed out for each of our individual lives and how we are an agent in that story so this is plays it out. ludicrously big picture stuff and yeah uh, we, we spent a good amount of time on this last time around the first two verses of this are greetings yep and one of the things that I think at least for me, um, when I when I picked this book up a few months ago, that jumped off the page was how short the greetings were compared to other, you know, letters of Paul in the right. New Testament. Right. He just gets right to it. So I'm Paul, and you're the Ephesians, and okay, or some stuff about God. Right. <laughs> well, the one theory on that is, um, like we mentioned, that some have posited that this was actually an open letter. Um, meant to be carried from Ephesus to the next city to the next city to the sure. next city. So it was kind of like a circular letter. That's one possibility. I think another possibility, and I didn't read this in any smart books or anything, but it seems like a possibility. The growth curve in Ephesians, or in Ephesus, as it's recorded in Acts, it grew really quickly. And uh, Paul hasn't been there for a few years, and so he's coming back and writing them now, and he's probably addressing a lot of people who only know him in reputation only. And so it's, I think it's pretty likely that he left it more vague in, because of that, and doesn't have a personal relationship with all these people, but he sent his personal greetings with the letter carrier, whom is listed at the very end in 621. Tychicus, Tychicus. Tychicus? That's an option? Well, if it, it would be a... I'm going with Tychicus because it sounds cool. It does sound cool. Yeah, well, I it's don't a, care about your stupid it, grammar it's rules and your fancy Greek. Well, it's just it's an umlock. It's an ubden, ublik. What is it actually? I don't know what it is. Uh, oh, you threw me off. You threw me off. <laughs> really? German. That worked? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's irrelevant. That's what it is. It's an okay, upsilon. Right, the Y right. is an upsilon, so it would be a... I guess I've heard of that. I vaguely remember that from school. The uh, Yoda would actually have an E sound, so to keep to keep us, I think I'm not for sure. So anyway, I'm impressed. Yeah, um, yeah. A couple things that maybe there are here in these first two verses is one right off the bat. There's a theme that I see that seems to keep coming up, which is that who people are is defined by their orientation to God, or in this case, Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's a subtle thesis, but uh, Paul then describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And he says about the people of Ephesus that you are saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So mm -hmm. me and you, author and recipient to this letter, mm -hmm. are both defined in this way. The same way when you're around somebody really important, mm -hmm. like the president, everybody is defined by what role they play in relation mm -hmm. to the president. President's sure. advisor, this, secretary, that, whatever it might be. Sure. So that yeah, the theme of being something different than you were before 
Mm -hmm. Understanding who you are as a right. person who's a part of this story mm -hmm. is going to come up a lot, especially in the first half. Uh, totally. So maybe that's a sneaky way of putting that in there. Or maybe it's just something that Paul thought was true, and so it came through in the greeting whether he meant it to or not. Well, I like the way you said that because I've, I've said this in, in different places. Um, I say this a lot. That if, you, if you're going to be a Christian, then you're defined by definition. By definition, you're defined by your relationship to Christ. You're not defined by what you do or don't do. Now, what you do or don't do is not unimportant, but it's not the defining thing that makes you. And I think if we just go with the big gonna, picture structure of this book, that follows. That follows. Yeah. So, because the stuff that you do, mm -hmm. though it's mostly described in principles where you have to actually think and mm -hmm. put in effort. In fact, he will come to that in three. But he says that specifically. Yeah. Which you figure this out rather than me telling you. It's a little bit you. slicker than how I said it, but yeah. Um, but it starts with this idea of first, you are this. Yes. And I really do think that's important in general. And and, and um, I'm completely body language mirroring you right now. Do you see that? <laughs> I, I, I guess I just really want you I to just, feel comfortable. I just triggered you. Sorry. <laughs> triggered. So there's, um, for me, this is a bit timely too, because I feel like American Christianity's identity is being messed with a little bit right now with the 2016 election that's unfolding as we record this. Like, who are we? What do we think? Why do we think certain stuff is a certain way and not another way? Because sometimes when Christianity is floundering, it looks like it's just one of many special interest group where people team together to get power. Right. And I th think that's a criticism that could be leveled against Christianity in the United States right now if somebody really wanted to nitpick they could say it, it looks like you guys will just support anything because you want power and I realize that now like half the people who are watching this are probably grumpy with me and I hope we can get along anyway no, they're not grumpy they just turned it off and <laughs> <it's> off. <laughs> yeah, they're not even hearing this part it's great <laughs> yeah. the, and, and what I like about this is that just right off the bat this introduces the concept that there is a there is an ideological theological identity level mooring to who we are and what we think and why we do it the way we do. Mm -hmm. It is not just an arbitrary power grab by finding some other people who are into kind of the same stuff. Absolutely. The argument is that this is actual truth. This is an actual description of reality. And you can take it or leave it. There's no force implied, right? Yeah, you know, or demonstrated here. But I think when Christianity has done well through the centuries it's when we've been kind of dialed into this and when we've done crappy through the centuries less I principled. think it's when it's less principled and just I don't know I vaguely mm -hmm. like I'm on team Jesus it's on the banner back there whatever but let's just get into how I win mm -hmm. and I think the same would go for me I, mm -hmm. I think when I have less at Christianity it has generally been when it's the more principled version it's maybe a little more grounded in the whole, oh yeah, this is the story and this is who this Jesus is. This is the story and this, and this is, is reality. Fit. Right. And when I have not been my best as a Christian, I think it has tended to be more about tribalism. This is my team. And so I just do some arbitrary stuff for no good principled reason. Right. Yeah. 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 So what he's doing here, that, that's, that's an interesting way to frame it up. And I think it's I think it's accurate. I'm sure he had all kinds of other things in his mind. He you don't think saying, he was picturing the 2016 United States presidential election, though? Oh my goodness! If he did, he had to be rending his garments and throwing <laughs> dust on his head. I'm sure somebody has read the Bible and viewed it all as a prophetic utterance about oh. this election, but they're wrong. Okay. So anyway, yeah, what he's doing there is he's he is he's laying out the, you know, reality is what grounds you to move forward. And this is your new spiritual reality. This is what defines you. And so then, you know, the hinge will come in chapter four. Like we said, you, okay, so now here's how you go forward with that. But he's laying this, this, not even philosophical, that gives you the impression of too lofty a deal. He's, this is how it is now. Mm -hmm. That's how it's always and been. It's how it's now always you know. been, and now you're tied into it. Yeah. So this is, this is the story of the universe. And here's how you're going to fit into it. Oh, by the way, now. Yeah, that's what he's saying. That's pretty gutsy. And, and, and then he jumps in and he says, you know, the, the chapter one just soars. In fact, he doesn't even explain it to them. He doesn't even address it to them. He begins with this, 
it's eulogy. a benediction. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what do you well, call you it. We both just use the wrong term. It's yeah. A, well, it's eulogitos is the the blessed. You know, it's a blessing. He's just, you know, he greets them and he says, "Oh, it's good to talk to you." And I'm like, oh, blessed be God, the Father of okay. our Lord Jesus Christ, who's done all this crazy stuff for us and blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and He chose us before the foundation of the world and he's done all these things for us and he adopted us and and it's just he just the language just falls all over itself kind of like a waterfall just spews out yeah and it's interesting that it's framed up that way and i guess one more point on the first two verses before oh, sorry, we talk yeah, about yeah, that yeah. is the other thing is because this is so generically addressed mm -hmm. one of the things that's kind of fun about that is it's much easier to eavesdrop on this letter it's much easier to just mm -hmm. take, of all the letters in the New Testament, I find this one to be the most, you know what, I'm just going to act like it was written to me. Good enough. Right. I understand there's some cultural differences. I understand right. that requires a little bit of mental cheating. We kind of do that with everyone, but this one more so because there's not a specific problem This one, addressed. it kind of works. It works better It's a than statement the of reality and a description of... Mm -hmm. Christian theology and Christian self, uh, who are we in mythology, I'm not sure on right. the word sounds, on that one. Good. Thank you. Make it work. It's, I'm not making it work. That <laughs> yeah. utterly failed. And But it's easier for me to, it's easier for me to talk about this one like, all right, this is, mm -hmm. this is directed at us and that's okay. Right. And part of it is because, well, this isn't really directed at us. It's just a statement of reality. Right. That is as valid as it is now. And right. Yeah. yeah. And if he says, if, so if you're in Christ, you know, he says that these things are true mm -hmm. about you. Mm -hmm. uh, then is now. It's it's interesting too that rather than framing this as a okay lesson number one Ephesian church shall be called who God is and how stuff is going to be. Mm -hmm. It's this is not a debate. This is not a discussion to Paul. This is the this is story the nature of redemption. The, the story exciting of thing the nature ever. of reality. This is exactly this is how things are. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in our view, and it's good. Yeah. He's, he's well, it's so good that he doesn't even describe it. He just launches into praise about it. What he tells us about it is a little bit of an afterthought, as he's praising, as he's praising God for it. Yeah, he certainly writes like someone who is convinced, uh, enamored. That's a better way to put it. Yeah, uh, overflowing with it, just enthralled uh, find your mm -hmm. find your descriptor well a lot of people argue for a lot of things and I guess I, I get conditioned to what am I trying to say I, I get conditioned to sift through the crap a little bit I, I know that that's just your opinion that's your perspective so like, okay what's your I angle? know you don't really have per se any convincing evidence, but this is how you feel about the world. And mm -hmm. I do a lot of the same. What's different here is that if we accept the historical record of Acts, you know, assume that the things that happened to Paul happened to Paul, that he saw the stuff that he saw. Mm -hmm. I, his faith is not like yours or mine, where we know in part and we prophesy in part. We know in part and we reason in kind of piece it together in part he, knew he just more saw fully. all of it he knew more fully he saw it he saw dead people stop being dead he got to help make people Can't who were dead not that. too dead yeah I mean it's he saw insane miraculous stuff happen and so did the people he was writing to I mean they, they saw it the people he he's writing to saw a kid get bored during a sermon and fall out of a window and die falling from you know third second third story whatever it was and they saw the kid come back to life right before their eyes. Mm. So if I read a manifesto about somebody's view of the world, there's a grain of salt involved. Mm -hmm. But if I'm Paul and I'm writing this, or I'm the original audience and I'm reading this and I was there to see the same stuff Paul saw, mm -hmm. this is not some kook's tinfoil hat manifesto. This is, this is backed up by what I've seen unfold with my five senses. Mm -hmm. It's not religious theory, is my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know it is, and he just he just lays it out, and he's he's just enraptured with it. It's, oh, this is how it is. 
And isn't it good? Isn't it awesome? Isn't it wonderful? You and know? he's not getting into any of the implications yet. No, uh, no, he's just celebrating that it is. And this this whole thing, verses 3 through 14 in this first paragraph, you know, I, after the, the greetings, the short greetings, that whole chunk is one long run-on sentence where the language just kind of continues to just unfold. And you can kind of, Paul's just going on and on and on, and you can kind of picture the scribe who's taking notes for him, trying to keep up. How do you tell where one sentence ends and the next one starts in a language that doesn't have punctuation, though? Uh, somebody smarter than me would have to say that. <laughs> I tried to lob you a little softball there. So we'll leave that at we have no idea, yeah. even though theoretically we're supposed to. Well, I mean, you could pick up the themes and the verbs and stuff, you sure. know. And you, so if, if you really took the time to break down the Greek, you, you could tell... But we're not native Greek speakers, so they would have read it out loud, and they would have just kind of automatically heard heard the pauses and breaks and things. The same way culturally, we know what it sounds like for somebody to gush. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, what what is the nature of that gushing? Um, so it starts with you know, praise to God for all of this stuff, mm-hmm. and then verse four. We only get three verses in without controversy. Verse four leads mm-hmm. us into... Here it comes. Some that people really historically like to fight about in church. I'll read this one. Like for he chose us, so you know, praise God, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he, ah, warning, predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he's freely given us in the one he loves. Well... Aaron Utech. Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, mm-hmm. 1 being an Arminian heretic, 10 being a Calvinist heretic, what heretical number would you land on in between? Uh, you know, I don't know what, where you take... Whatever you say, it's going to be wrong. Calvinist, probably. Whatever Somebody's going to yell at you. <laughs> That's fine. They can yell at me. Uh, a Calvinist 10, how does that become a heretic? Because somebody's going to think it makes you a heretic. Okay, okay. I get you right. Well... I remember I was at a Bible study in college, and uh, I I was a student leader, and there was a, a young woman who was kind of learning to lead the Bible studies, and uh, so I was sitting in with her, and this, this guy was giving her trouble, and uh, he was just being difficult, and he was going on and on, well, that can't be true, and that can't be true, and she was, she was kind of looking at me, she kind of looked at me, and I just said, dude, something you need to know, okay, as it comes to election, Two words. It's true. And he was just kind of... And the girl kind of looked at me, and he was silent, and she went on with her study. The thing about election is, people won't like it, but it's true. Election being this idea that that God God picked. picked And God sovereignly has a plan over the the universe, and that he makes his plan come to bear. And that part of that plan means that some people are just going to become... Followers of God? Yes. That so, some of those people are just going to be redeemed, no matter how much they kick and scream. Yes. Okay? Yes. So, whatever you believe in addition to being free and how we choose, and I believe that though logically incompatible, those things are also taught in Scripture, the truth that God elects those who will be His children is true. Indisputable. Why would you say it's indisputable? Because it's in the scripture. If you're going to dispute it, you're disputing with the scripture. What about the person who would say, because some election occurs does not mean that everyone who is a Christian was elected? I'd say that's obfuscating. That's confusing the the, the terms. Okay, but for some people, yeah. I, okay, the reason, like, just turn our cards here. The reason that this is mm-hmm. a big issue for some mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. is that they think it makes God look bad. Right. They think that if God created a world mm-hmm. and then allowed that world to suffer the effects of mm-hmm. sin and fallenness, right, and then created people and mm-hmm. allowed people to keep creating more people mm-hmm. through an unmentionable act that has no place on this channel. Then <laughs> season the tension, baby. Not mention it. And then doesn't that make God bad? 
because he created people who were going to get judged and he knew they were going to get judged. And so I think I think the pushback is mm-hmm. that it doesn't sound like kind of how I picture God to be throughout the Bible. So there's got to be there's got to be another way that this works. So how do we resolve this? Important. It's a really important issue. Sorry, I leaned away. It's all right. Um, you. So how do we resolve that? The the first way you got it. You can't just say, well, this verse on on its own. That isn't all the story. It also says that you know um, God does not delight in the death of the wicked, but He wants all to repent. God um, loves all, um, but He chooses some. So if if we delve deeper and we get into this more in chapter two, but the reason God elects is because we're incapable of doing anything on our own. So it isn't that God makes you a Christian against your will, but God enables your will to want to choose God. And we'll come to that more in chapter two, really. He says, you are dead, God made you alive. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll mm-hmm. come to that. The thing to note here, though, is part of the story is important. Paul's gushing with praise. This is a good thing. This is a praiseworthy thing. In love, he predestined us for adoption. That's, this is a loving uh, demonstration of God's character. It's not something that we should shy away from. Okay, and I'm going to go down that road with you because I, I read that the same way, that he's right. celebrating this. Yes. That Paul absolutely does not have in view mm-hmm. the fights of the later... You know, Reformation. Reformation stuff. Yeah, none of that stuff mm-hmm. is on his radar at all. This is mm-hmm. just flatly mm-hmm. good and exciting that there is a God, unlike we, st- you know, weak stick Artemis. There is a God who has the ability to pull this off. Mm-hmm. There is a greatest being, mm-hmm. and this greatest being, by definition, must know everything and be mm-hmm. in control of everything. Even it's going to blow your mind, letter recipients, even you, mm-hmm. and. If we're just looking at this, well then, yeah, I don't see any other way to read it. Mm -hmm. But, I'm not necessarily turning over my cards here, there certainly historically are people who would say, but how can that be a message of love if there is definitionally another side to that coin Mm -hmm. where a whole bunch of people just didn't even have a crack at it and they're Mm -hmm. just going to be judged and condemned and you can say, well, no, that's double predestination and that's different, Mm -hmm. but come on, what's... What's the difference if God is, knew yeah. you were created mm-hmm. for judgment or God knew you were created for redemption? Like, what would you say to the, the critic historically who pushes back on that and says that, that that's not a good-looking God? Well, you're free to make that assessment that it's not a good-looking God. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the Reformation as a so the, the debates around the Reformation. Um, so it's important to note the, the historical development of this debate. It, it kind of surfaced around the Reformation. Um, came to a boiling came, point during the English Civil War. Um, it, it was there, but almost all of Christendom has, a, has, has held to some form of the view that God is God and he has the right to do what he wants. Okay? The, where these ideas that that, that it's wrong for God to do so and that he would be a tyrant to impose his will against someone else's free will. Um, where those ideas really became popular was uh, in early America where people began to debate the idea that every individual um, has the right to determine their own destiny. Which I'm a, I, you know I'm a big fan of Huge that idea. Fan. Right. So I, I had this discussion with somebody on a, on a libertarian blog just yesterday. Um, Somebody asked a question. So you're one of those people who throws away their votes every four years? Uh, I, I <laughs> choose to view it differently. Okay, yeah, all right, that's fine. So, yeah, however uh, you want to frame it. Yeah, so um, I choose to vote for someone rather than against someone. Oh, right. That's not, that's not a, a sharp... No, I lost and that's what you get when we do this podcast this is style. Just, Right. Horrible Focus. meandering that makes no sense. Yeah, where we come back. Okay. Early America, so early people American felt like they could do whatever they want. People keep talking. Like I'm just going to push a button. Just keep talking. So, God, the idea that God would impose himself 
against people's wishes, um, that was out of, out of step with the day. And, and so we applied that thinking that each person should be allowed to, to, to you know, direct their own destiny. We applied that to theology. And except that God isn't like us. He's totally different. So God yeah, is... Yeah, that's the rub. That's the rub. That, it's, it's a total... It's, that's it. Because we... And, and where else can we begin, really? But thinking as a human, but, but to begin to think about God as something like us. Mm -hmm. That's our frame of reference. Mm -hmm. But m uh, most of our flaws, when we think about God, begin with thinking that he's a little bit bigger, better version of us. And you know I completely agree with that. Yes. I, how many times have we... In We've other conversations, about talked about so, that being so one of the foundational mistakes. Sorry, God, technical difficulties. Your point. God, by definition, being God, knows all things perfectly and has a perfect plan. Our rub is will we accept that? And so when we push back and say, well, God's not right to, do, to, to choose what we're saying, what we're, what we're believing, even if we don't realize it, is that we don't think God's going to get it right without our help. And, and that's... Yeah. And, and well, so it, that's okay. a question okay. of faith, and that's a, that's a fair question to wrestle with. I think with. it is a fair question. It's, it's a totally I, legitimate question. Is you, you've got... When you, and, and here it is, Paul, verse 4. Really? We couldn't wait until... you got to throw it right up front? <laughs> yeah, we're like... Well, because he's excited about it. Because to him, this thing this works. This is a good thing. But there, there are two types of there are two types of morality, right? You've got the morality that we reason to on our own. I'm a huge fan of that type of morality because mm -hmm. it works even if somebody doesn't share the same religious convictions. Mm -hmm. Historically, sometimes it gets called natural law, or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I can, without any God in the picture agree with someone from a different era in a different part of the world speaking a different language with a different culture that it's not right to kill somebody for no reason now you can hit me well now hold on i know of one culture one time that okay stop generally speaking we can agree on this stuff because mm -hmm. We know what it is to be alive, and we can kind of picture what it is to not be alive, and we think it would be better to continue to be alive. Mm -hmm. We reason to an equitable set of moral standards mm -hmm. as humans, not just for ourselves, but because eventually in life we figure out these moral standards have to work for others as well. Mm -hmm. You know, what is that, the Kantian mean? If it doesn't work together, if everybody did it, well, then it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. And so all of the stuff that we reason to morally is, is, is got to be born out of the, uh, the human experience. Sure. But there's this other level of morality mm -hmm. that is from the being that holds himself out as being the smartest, greatest being ever, who mm -hmm. knows everything and is never wrong and is unlimited in every way and unbound and by bad. all things. And never bad. And never bad. And whatever that being determines to be good or bad is good or bad. Yes. And that being is also just an inherent reflection of what is mm -hmm. good or bad. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these two things come into conflict, and I feel like this is one of those places. And I feel mm -hmm. like this tension between the free will, the, the strongly free will position, and the strongly deterministic mm -hmm. position mm -hmm. has a lot to do with that friction. Mm -hmm. By human reason, it's not fair for a God you don't believe in and didn't get a vote in deciding how he would be mm -hmm. to make any judgment on your character. Judging is wrong. Well, yes, it is by human reasoning because I have no right to judge you because, because we're I'm, peers. I'm fit to judge. Yeah, I'm, I'm flawed and I yes. will not judge properly. Right. The idea of a God who is an unlimited being saying judging is right as long as I'm the one doing it. It's all predicated on the idea that that being is yes. unlimited and always right and right. never fails and that's, in their judgments. And that's why I said God, by definition, yeah. Is, yeah. is good and perfect and, 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 and those things. And but most, most morality, even within Christianity, mingles between those two things. We have a tough time separating. I love self-determination and individualism because I think it gets the best out of people. I think it's just... And I think it's the most... And I think it's the best way to govern and to treat each other morally. It's the most... I think it's the most Christian expression of people because it treats people with dignity as image bearers... Agreed. In the, in, in, people but, in the image of God. But part of the reason I don't think I should rally people, take guns, 
and then make everyone live the way I want them to make is because I know this one thing about myself. Mm -hmm. Experience it many times. I've empirically verified this. Mm -hmm. I have the capacity for being wrong. Mm -hmm. So does everyone I've ever met. Mm -hmm. So I get real uncomfortable when people start talking about the greater good and we just got to shoot some people for the greater good. Like that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. But that's not the same thing as God because that one key distinction isn't present. God can't be wrong if we accept the idea of an Well, if he's wrong, he's God. not God. Okay, that, fair That's why I said by definition. The notion implodes. Yeah. Okay. If he's, if, he's, if he's wrong or he's malevolent or something, then he's not God. So, for reasons you brought up, for reasons I brought up, we just have to admit that when we come across a passage like this, mm -hmm. we're reading it wrong right off the bat. If you get to verse 4 and you're like, oh, this is a fight, you're not reading it in the spirit of what Paul is writing. Right. And, and you It's can, not you a polemic. Say, like, you can get after me it's, and say, oh, that's, well, you could be wrong. You just said you could be wrong. And you're yeah. right, I could be. Yeah, we could. But also, like, I can tell that Star Wars is a space opera, even though that's an opinion and not a fact. I'm right. right. It's a space opera where people kill people with lightsabers and fight for things. I know because we have common sense. And I know because of context and reason mm -hmm. that what dude is saying is this is awesome that God predestines mm -hmm. and that God does this. Mm -hmm. And that becomes clearer in two. And we'll unpack that when we get there. But um, he is celebrating it. He's not laying a polemic here. He's not, like you said, he's not, he's not, there's no fight here. And what I, my point is, you know, about the American experience in, in American Revolution is we need to realize that a lot of our modern pushback against that is informed by how our culture views things now. Mm -hmm. Most of human history didn't have that big a trouble with that idea that God had the right to be God. Sure. Most of human history never challenged that premise at all. Do you think the reason that we push back on it now is not because of a notion of Western democracy? and That's part of it. Individual it's also autonomy. Sin, it's also our, I would say, our sin nature. We, we, I mean, we've always been, and this is, again, chapter two, we're jumping ahead. We've always been, since the fall, opposed to the rule of God in our life. But we're, and so individually, we really latch on to anything that gives us cover for that, for that subconscious belief that we want to operate. So philosophically, in our culture today, we're a little more primed and, and we, we give ourselves a little more cover to think, well, nobody should be able to tell us what to do or think. But, you know, we need to identify our culture. Which I also. agree with if we're talking about a person-to-person -person relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm talking about It's just God. this is other. This and so, is, so other. it comes right back. To the, it's a our, different our difficulty category. in reading this passage comes right back to this simple like and easy mistake to make, which is to imagine that God is a slightly better version of us, like mm -hmm. a superhero. Yeah. You know, still with flaws and character issues and stuff. You know, like be in one place at one time, but he can fly and shoot lasers. So that's way mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. when, when we can't even scratch the surface no. of infinite as no. a concept. No. If there is, if the greatest being and the first cause of all existence and all things truly exists, mm-hmm, and is infinite and unlimited, and is that being which is more powerful than any other being that can even be conceived of. I just can't wrap my brain around that. And that means that that being could conceive of every possible reality that could ever occur. Yes. Any permutation of existence, he's and, thought of them all and run and, the and simulation and in his brain. And as he's run all those simulations, he knows what's the greatest good and causes it to be. And pick the greatest good. And not only is he the most powerful thing, He's the most beautiful thing. He's the most glorious, the most desirable, the most pleasurable. And I know that seems like a dirty word. It sounded a little Christian. the way you said it, and like with yeah. your eyes twinkling with the lights is creepy. But yeah, I, I knew what you meant. He's the most pleasure in the purest sense that any of us will ever experience. Infinite. So he isn't just powerful. But he's all things, any, any descriptor that we would think of good, God is, God is it infinitely. Well, maybe not anything, because we might, we might think of things that are good that aren't really good, but you understand what I'm saying. We tiptoed into um, a third point of view in response to this tension okay. that, that 
I'm not going to flesh out here, but I should make another little video where I talk about Molinism. Mm -hmm. This Luis de Molina guy, mm -hmm. a Spaniard, around the same time as mm -hmm. Calvin and these other characters, was proposing mm -hmm. this idea of an infinite God who knows every possible reality, including every possible decision that every possible individual in every possible reality could possibly make. And that then this God, in his infinite mind, infinite means infinite, you know everything, mm -hmm. adds it all up and says, which one brings the most glory to me and most accomplishes what I want? That one. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty fascinating position to dig into. I think they call it Molinism. Mm -hmm. Molinism? I don't know if I'm saying it right. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit. There are a couple of modern proponents for that. You don't hear it much. But well, the, what, what I like about that position is that it, it strikes a little bit of a middle ground on this tension and kind of does an end run around the mm -hmm. whole argument. Because mm -hmm. it says, well, in all of these imagined realities, maybe people do have you know, freedom that people assume we have. But certainly God's sovereignty is very impressive in calculating all of that up and again a conversation for another time bottom line is this because we got to get on with chapter one well I, this is positive it is good this is I, good i resolve the tension a different way go ahead go ahead okay so um i think that's interesting um and possible the one thing i would I just initially push back say well god doesn't kind of i mean He's all knowledge. I mean, yeah, that's possible, but doesn't need to, um, because any any potential plan that he would put forward, he doesn't need another contingency because his plan is already best. You know what I'm saying? So he wouldn't need to run the. I think Molina would say, "How see. could he not?" How, but yeah. So I mean, if you're if infinite, he, he, how you're, could you not calculate now, it? Now you're sort of in the category of how many angels can stand the head of the pit. Maybe, you know, except yeah. this one matters. Uh, sort of. Yes. In a sense, it doesn't. Because if you will, disagree with Luis de Molina, you hate Spaniards. <laughs> That's how I take it. I like Mexicans. No, does that count? Well, it He's doesn't Spanish. count. And your words are hurtful, and I have been microaggressed against <laughs> as someone who knows people from Spain or knows that there are people in Spain. Right. It's very hurtful. Where it doesn't ma where it where it doesn't matter is the difference that it, 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 both affirm that God. Does the best possible good. Yep. So that I means that's it. The way the way I resolve it is this, and I think this is important to say, because the scripture does affirm that we are free and we are responsible for our choices. And I'm not I'm I'm not saying that. And, and it not feels like that. that's how it is. Well, I mean, it feels like I just picked all of that random stuff to do. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you that did. was determined. You did. No, okay. it doesn't feel. It yeah. It feels like our choices are real. You're. Do I need to buy this house, or should I take this new job, or should I go work for these people, or this church, or should I go to this church? Which Chinese church? symbol should I tattoo on the base of my neck? All of these things sure. are, are significant, and they're yeah. real choices. I'm going okay? to weasel, by the way. So, so the I look at Acts 17, where it says, you know, Paul is speaking to the Athenian philosophers, and he's describing... The biblical God in terms that they could resonate with and he says in him we live and move and have our being he's speaking to people there that are you know in Ephesians 1 he says these people are in Christ and that speech there he's not speaking to people who are in Christ they are non-believing pagan philosophers mm -hmm. so he says in him in God we live and move and have our being that's really significant because it, it, it says that you know when when we think of this question between agency, human agency, and God's sovereignty, we think of it like a tug of war. We think of two parties mm -hmm. pulling back and forth. But it, it, it's maybe more like a flow chart where God is sovereign over all and we're in Him, but yet we're independent. I should say we're not, we're not independent of Him, but we're free in Him. So in other words, even his, even in my free will, I'm not independent of him. So my choices to put Chinese symbols on the back of my neck or attend okay. a certain church are legitimate choices, but they are the legitimate choices that God ordained. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Okay. That gets right to the heart of it. Okay, let's get right to the heart of it. Judas and his choice 
to betray the Son of God. Satan was also a creature. Same second chapter to that same story. Satan believed that he was finally going to overthrow God and, and by, by crucifying Christ. He did exactly what God had foreordained already. He's a creature, just like us. He has different powers and abilities than we have. But he's a creature like us. And he's in, he, exi he doesn't exist outside of God the Father. You can, you can see the same thing affirmed in Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1, where it says, In him, or no, um, uh, he's, he holds all things together, he sustains all things. Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. we have life, even in, even in our rebellion, every breath is a gift. If the universe doesn't have Christ sustaining it, it just unravels. So when we say, that you know our choices are free they are free we are held accountable for them they're real but they're also not independent of god so now hmm. in terms of human logic okay in terms of human reason we're going to say ah oh, that's impossible i think that's what the scriptures teach even if we can't reconcile it with our finite minds by definition, then there's, there's going to be a point that we're going to say, this one hurts. I can't quite wrap my mind around it. I think that's what the scriptures... So in the scriptures, we have a window into an infinite mind. And so we should expect to bump up against that and say, man, there's some things here that I can't comprehend. Yeah. That doesn't seem okay. to work together. And so I'm, I'm content, and I would say this too, when, when, and this was my own journey as a new Christian in college, you start to come up with some of these things about God, and it's like all of a sudden, I thought I knew this guy, and all of a sudden, where are the walls? Uh, everything got a lot bigger, and I feel like I'm in a much bigger ocean, and I don't know where, I don't know how to get to the shore and feel safe again. That's okay. That's an okay spot to be in. In fact, in terms of spiritual growth and learning to love and follow God, that's a healthy thing, really. Um, Agreed. And it's, it's okay if, if, if people look at that and they struggle with that, hey, it's, it's, it is tough. I'm, I'm comfortable saying, you know, or working through that with people or saying, you know, somebody's at a different spot on that than I am. We can worship together. We can work together. Sure. Um, it, this isn't like, hey, you got to do this. Or you're, you a know. lot of people treat it that way, though. Well, okay. this is like the fight. For this a lot is of the thing, yeah. And and people that love this issue, um, like to fight about this issue. If Don't those if that. those people, yeah. the Calvinist folks, if they like to fight about something. It's this thing. And the thing is that we as humans, we latch on to a little bit of truth, and then like to feel like we've mastered it, and then kind of lord it over. Well, and we think it's the cipher that decodes the whole riddle. And I think, yeah, that's, I think that's where a lot it. of that yeah. know, combative energy comes from with mm -hmm. this fight. For me, I come at it this way. Please. Um, I'm at peace with whatever. Like you said, I expect this friction. If there was a time for me where a passage like this, I, deep down, if I were to be honest, I would have to admit this is almost a strike against my faith. Like, oh stinks that I have to answer these questions and defend this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, why does it have to be in there? It mm -hmm. makes it seem like I got to make God look good. And mm -hmm. why do I have to do all the heavy lifting around here? Like, I, I think I've been there. But the more I think about this stuff, and I could be wrong, but if you're going to have a situation where the infinite maker of all things interacts with the finite object of redemption, that being us, there are a couple of frictions that just have to overlap, and a necessary friction between those two is the friction between individual agency and the sovereignty of an unlimited being who is surprised by nothing and in control of everything. Yes. How, it's just, they don't, they don't mush together very well, but they're both right. necessary. Yes. And so, it, if I were to invent a religion, and I keep thinking about it, but if I were to invent one, one... It would it'd definitely involve, like, shocking amounts of money. Like, that would be in there. But two, I'd skip this. 
I just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't speak to it at all. And maybe centuries down the road, somebody would reason to it, but I'd already be super rich and everything would be fine for me and they can all worry about that later. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's here and the scriptures, not just here, but on multiple occasions, lean into this friction between the sovereign and the finite, it's all over. To me, smacks of credibility and reality. Yes. If a person made it, they'd duck this issue. And so, yeah. so for me, weirdly, passages like this have a secondary level of assurance to me. Uh, does that sound weak and frail? I, I can't think of a better word. Because I'm glad they acknowledge that this friction is yeah. just got to be there. And if that's how this religion is going to be, if we believe that there's a God who's unlimited and all-powerful, this rub has to happen. Yes, that's and a different way of saying what I tried to say. A better, yeah. better way of saying it. Right. I'd say yeah. yours was good, but mine... Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep trying harder. No, sorry. It, yours worked. I, <laughs> I, I, I probably just repeated 80% of what you said. No, no, it, you it, said it uh, differently, but, but that's it. If, it. if we're getting a window into the mind of an infinite God, we ought to choke on a couple things. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're we processing should different that. things here. I think... I think I may be in a place where I grapple with this a little bit more than you do. I think you've landed a while back or come closer to landing on it. And so my questions are a little bit more oriented toward what do I do with this friction? Mm -hmm. And I'm more at peace with that than I have been in the past, I guess, is what I'm driving at. Which is yeah. not the point of this passage. Here's what I think the point of this passage is. Please. Whether you are... A person who has a John Calvin tattoo and drinks John Calvin beer and makes regular pilgrimages to Geneva, Switzerland to sit in John Calvin's chair, or someone who thinks all of that stuff is insane. Do they let insane. you sit in the chair? Well, they don't let you, but they can't watch it 24 7. I mean, you've been there. Did you sit I'll in the chair? I'll provide photographs. So, whichever, wherever you fall on the <laughs> spectrum of this debate, I feel like the message here is the same. You are a product of tremendous forethought and tremendous power on the part of God. Yes. And you were a product of all that forethought and power for a reason. Intentionally. He knew what would be weird about you and problematic about you, and he made you anyway. You are on purpose. He knew you and I were going to, our hair was going to fall out. Well, when you have a shapely head, ain't nobody complaining. Yeah. Especially Mrs. Whitman. (laughs) And, and I feel like, okay, so we can nitpick and argue about what does that intentionality and forethought mean. And we can burn through energy or even burn down some villages, as some people have done over this issue. Oh, or yeah, yes. we can just say, define it how you want. God definitely did some serious authoring mm-hmm. in advance because God mm-hmm. is really cool and unlimited. And this is not a text to fight about. This is a text to get excited about. Yes. Like Paul is excited it's a text to because it sets the stage for where everything mm-hmm. is. And it stakes God's claim of ownership on you. Yes. It's a stark reminder that you aren't an accident in a public, secular way. Sure, you own your body, you own yourself. But there is one authority higher who is definitely right, and that's God. And he's going to cash in on that claim that's laid out here later on. Mm-hmm. But... You might start to get the impression that, oh, okay, so we were predestined. He did all this stuff. I mean, I mean, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. See, that's awesome. Then he lav- that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Also awesome. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things on heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. Awesome, 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 awesome. So none of this sounds oppressive to me. Mm -hmm. at all there's Mm -hmm. no slave language here no in him we were also chosen having been the word again predestined according to the plan of whom of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to hope in christ might be for the praise of his glory which verse aha that's 12 uh, 12 so verse 6 and verse 12 are are matching verses to the praise of god's glorious Mm -hmm. grace he did all this stuff now we're just talking cosmic things Mm mm-hmm and that makes him look good. And now we're talking about you and where you fit and what he did cosmically to ordain and orchestrate that. Mm-hmm. Same phrase. And you make him look good. Not by you having everything figured out, but by the fact that God crafted this whole thing well, look at verse for six. his purposes. Yes, verse 6 is um, slightly different. And then 12 and then even 13 or 14 are 
repetitions of it. The okay. Phrases repeated three sure. times. Sure. The first one is to the praise of his glorious grace. So the way we make him look good is by receiving grace. Absolutely. The I way, read it the same way. Yeah. The way we make him look good is not by being good, but by being a mess that's redeemed in by his supernatural intervention. Plus nothing. Plus nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and so that, that is, he said, well, why did God allow the fall and do these things? And, and why did he do it this way? Because we wouldn't praise his grace. We couldn't praise his grace if we never had a fall. We know about it theoretically. Mm-hmm. We could talk about it. But we would only know grace. We would only know that attribute of God and that whole side of God if through this particular plan. So again, he does all things in a way that will bring him the most glory. In a way that is the most glory. If a person did that, it would make him a jerk. Yes. Seriously, if, if you live your whole life to point out how cool Aaron is, mm-hmm. like, totally. Like, we're not hanging out. We're not doing this <laughs> because you're insufferable. Right. And, and we've all known, and maybe even all for moments, been that kind of person. Oh, it just loses their mooring and all of a sudden I'm becomes... Sure. Uh, yeah. Totally. An arrogant bore. Mm-hmm. But it... Okay, so it, that's I, great. It's cool if it's true. That's like if great. all your bragging is true, it's a little different. So here's why it's important. God doing everything he could to draw the most attention to himself, if he really is the most perfect and beautiful being never created, then drawing attention to himself is a gift and not an egomaniac. That's smart. Boy, I've thought about that a lot, and I've never said it that way. That's smart. Thanks. You're good at things. I'm good for one of today. <laughs> let's uh, let's bring this toward the the finish line because I I think we're I think we're getting what he's trying to say here in chapter one, and, and maybe other people read it way different, but to me it seems really obvious. But mm-hmm. the second thought in chapter one is is that through all of this predestination, through all of this great forethought and effort mm-hmm. that God put into us to use generic terms that might work for a broader audience comes this flip from being people who are on the outside looking in to being not just now you're okay with God mm-hmm. but like fully in good standing even using the language of being mm-hmm. children and heirs and having an inheritance mm-hmm. and I think that's really crucial especially if we embrace the suggestion that a big part of what Paul's doing in the first half of this book is to say here's who you are yeah, Here's what I, God's doing. Here's who you are in light of that. I like the way you said it in your introduction. It, it, it kind of bounces back You didn't back like the way forth. I just said it? Mm-hmm. You want, should I do a mulligan? Was that terrible? It was, it was okay. okay. I was just alluding to something else you said. That was but, better. Yeah, okay. Was, well, well, you pointed out that the, the, in, in your outlining, it, it bounces back and forth between the macro picture to the individual, to the macro picture to the individual. And uh, so it does. Yeah, it's like... The two together are mind blowing. This is one thing to say, "Oh, God is, oh, God loves you, has a plan for your life." You know, that sounded it's, nice. It's not thank you. You need to work on your sympathetic eyebrows, though. Your I, eyebrows were still pointed down. Oh, that's so yeah. much better. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, you could paint that God, who the center of his whole universe is you. But that God say, makes no sense. That God makes no sense. And in fact, that's not God. I'm for, an atheist toward that God. For, for God to have us at the center of his affections would be idolatry. Yeah, and so irrational and logically implosive. Right. It, it just all kinds work. of All kinds of problems. Yeah. So we could create that kind of God, and we could talk in too much of church language. I could point I you to several YouTube videos that do create Unintentionally, that kind of God. I, think, I think people do. I think mostly unintentionally, but I think it... It has problems with it. So we could create that kind of God, but it's totally different to say God has his glory at the center of his mind and understanding and plan. And oh, and you are intimately woven into it. That's, that's a totally different message. That's a big deal. That, that's a big deal. Yeah, and that's a, that's when, a when you're stop. When you're fake humble, but I know you know stuff and you're smart, mm-hmm. It doesn't irritate me because you're not really lying. You're being fake humble, 
but you're choosing to be humble because you should be because you're not always right about stuff, mm-hmm. even though you're right about a lot of stuff and say smart things. Like, I don't mind the person who does the self-effacing, you know, oh, hey, you know, I, I got limitations, I don't know what I'm doing. It, maybe they do think they're smart, but they're trying to check themselves because they know they are finite. They know that man is mortal, whereas God, on the other hand, if he even did the the fake humility thing, that would be just be lying, lying. Mm-hmm. and it would be depriving people of the truth, beauty, perfection, uh, creepy pleasure thing that you said, you know, that is mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. And to bring it to the home stretch, this language that that you fit specifically in a certain place is what's mm-hmm. going to launch us into chapter two. Mm-hmm. So how did that process work that I went from being on the outside looking in, thinking maybe this was never going to be for me because Gentile readers, they would have been thinking that on two levels, mm-hmm. the individual level and the ethnic level. Mm-hmm. How, how did this process happen? Where was I and where am I now? Mm-hmm. And what is that? What are the implications? That's what a lot of chapter two is going to wrestle with. That's and good. we will round the corner into that here in just a minute. In the meantime... I think we're going to try to do seven of these things. We're going to try to do them all in one day in the same fancy outfits that we're wearing right now. Uh, thanks to the Blackstone Inn in Leed. We keep saying Leed. I we're think going it's with Leed. Leed. It's <laughs> we hope it's called Leed, South Dakota. The uh, Blackstone Inn, they've been super hospitable to us. So if you're ever passing through Leed, South Dakota, you'd be dumb to stay anywhere else. My friend Aaron Utek. Pastors of Church in North Dakota. The website at that church again is IBC Emmanuel Baptist Church Beulah, B E U L A H, IBCBeulah.com. He puts his sermons on there. They're good. They're grounded. They sound different than the way I say it. Um, so if that sounds fun, no, look him clever. up. Oh, clever oh gosh. Thanks, man. Humble brag. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you like what's going on with this stuff, um, please subscribe to the channel. If uh, this is just too much to digest, might I recommend checking out everything else that I do, which comes in much shorter chunks. Either way, we'll be back in just a second with Ephesians chapter 2. Thanks for hanging around with us.